This session, um, which I'm very happy to welcome you to, is is a not not only academic session as we have most sessions here, but it's actually also about a very um, applied um, work using research and using modeling to inform policy debates. It's so to say the second arm of the SouthMod project, uh, and it's why a big reason why we built these models, of course and why we maintain them with all our partners in so many countries um, in Africa, but also in Latin America and, uh, and Asia. So today I'm very happy to say that we have contributions from three different countries in Africa, from Uganda, from Zambia, and from Mozambique. And um, they have three very different questions that they ask in each. But I think a lot of commonalities as well, and there's a lot of common challenges as well. So we'll talk about what the projects did, but also what were the challenges. And that's also something for the questions um, that we hope to have a discussion on in the end. With that, enough from myself. I would now hand it over to Mbewe. Mbewe, if you can uh, unmute yourself, share the video and share your screen. After Mbewe, I would ask Ronald to be ready to follow right after Mbewe with his presentation. Uh, the time is 10 minutes per presentation so that we have time to discuss uh, in the end. So with that, Mbewe, over to you. All right. <clears throat> thank you, everyone, and thank you, colleagues, for joining through this um, conference. So um, my, my presentation basically is um, looking at uh, a simulation on the Cash Plus using uh, the micro ZAMOD. And this work has been supported by colleagues, uh, Katrin, David, and Maria. And of course, my other colleague from uh, Zipa, Miselo, who's uh, not with us, he's um, in another meeting. So I'll be the one that's going to run through this uh, presentation. <clears throat> so to start my presentation, I'll just basically introduce the Cash Plus, or just to basically put everyone up to speed in understanding what this Cash Plus is. So according to the Household Survey of 2015, which is a Living Conditions Monitoring Survey in Zambia, it states that poverty remains as high as 54.4% of the entire population. So in this regard, the Zambian government tried to intervene to improve the social and economic situation in the Zambian economy, and they introduced what is known as the social cash transfer. So what they do with the social cash transfer is basically they just give these poor and vulnerable households cash payments to supplement their day-to-day their -day living. So that's the concept of the social cash transfer. But with time, it's been seen that this social cash transfer, as much as it is helping the poor and the vulnerable, it's not so effective to actually bring these people out of poverty or act to get to the target that which the government wants. So what they did in 2019 is they introduced a cash plus reform where we use the social cash transfer as a flow benefit. So that means you give the household a cash amount, then you add a complementary benefit, which, which aims actually just to remove these people out of that poverty bracket. So this is how the cash plus works. So it works on the social cash transfer and then introduce a complementary benefit. So the cash plus itself as a study was initiated in August of 2020 at a technical meeting where we had UNY that was present, we had ILO, we had SASPRI and other cooperating partners that have been supporting the project from inception up to now. And then the main, the main aim of this study was just to analyze the coverage and impacts of the current social protection policy. So the current social protection system how is it operating? And then also to try and simulate this cash plus or the reforms or the scenarios that we are trying to say. If we add these complementary benefits, what would the effect on poverty and the like? So like I've mentioned earlier, so this is a study which is a collaborative project between Zipa, uh, SASPRI, UN wider. We've also got support from ILO, International Labor Organization. And also, of course, the Bright Ministry, which is Ministry of Community Development and Social Services. And of course, other ministries, including 
FAO, it's Food Agriculture Organization. So this cash plus is being implemented in two phases. So in phase one, like I mentioned earlier, we just do an analysis of the social protection system to see how is it operating, what is impact on poverty? Is there any gaps in the coverage? And then we, we look at, so basically as a whole, we just look at how is the current social protection system working? Then in phase two is now where we introduce the cash policy reforms to say, if we add a benefit to the social cash transfer, what would be the effect on poverty? What would be the effect on equality? So that's what we basically do in phase two. Then in terms of the programs that we're simulating for this project or that we were simulating for this project. So firstly, we had the social cash transfer, like I mentioned, which is the flow program. And the main target group is vulnerable households in urban and rural areas. And then the amount per year, because this is a monthly transfer. So in a year, they get 1,080 kwacha. So kwacha is the Zambian currency. And if you divide this by 12, so each household or whoever qualifies to be sitting on this program gets 90 kwacha per, per month. So if you multiply that by 12, it gives you the 1,080 kwacha. And this program is rolled out nationwide. Then we've got the electronic farmer input support program. So this also just supports small scale farming households, which actually graduate from the food security pack, which I explained just now. And then they're given inputs with 1,700 kwacha per year, and it's also rolled out nationwide. Then we've got the food security pack, which is something similar to the farmer input support program, but this one gives it to vulnerable but viable small scale farming households. So they've got a criteria in which you fit in this food security pack. And it gives um, inputs with 5,100 5, kwacha, and it's also rolled out nationwide. Then we also had the supporting women's livelihood. And um, it's it's um, the main target group. It's women that are living in these social cash transfer households. And the amount pay or the support that they're given is 2,900. And it's only rolled out in 64 districts. So it's not a nationwide program, but only in 64 districts. Then we've also got the keeping girls in school which uh, supports this, uh, which supports girls that are, which supports uh, girls that are in secondary school. And it provides a certain amount as a school fee. And it's only rolled out in 29 districts. Then we've got the homegrown school feeding program, which provides food to, to school children in public and community schools. And the amount pay that they get is 264. Of course, this is converted to monetary terms, but it's more like it's food that is given, but in monetary terms, it comes to 264 kwacha, and it's only in 25 districts. And you've got the community skills development and training, vulnerable youths, amount pay is 3,000, and it's only rolled out in 11 districts. So based on, like I explained, we had phase one, which was just looking at the current social protection system. So the results that we got from phase one, it says that the current social protection system only provides support to 76% of the extremely poor population. And then our main interest was to see how much or what's the proportion of this extremely poor population that is covered by the social cash transfer because that's the flow program. And then we discovered that only 34% of the extremely poor population receive the social cash transfer, then 66% are not covered by the cash flow benefit. Further, the current social protection system reduces poverty by four percentage points and by six percentage points in those districts where additional programs have been rolled out. So if, for instance, we've got districts where there's not so much high support, probably where you just have like a social cash transfer program, that's where poverty is being reduced by about four percentage points. And then those where the additional programs, then poverty is being reduced by six, percent, six percentage points. Then, then the, uh, if you remember my, my, my previous slide where I was looking at the, the monetary amounts, we found that those benefits with high monetary amounts, for instance, maybe if I just go back, for instance, we go to the food security pack, it's got the monetary amount of 5,100. So those monetary amounts, monetary amounts uh, um, have got a greater impact on poverty 
but are only available to a small share of the extremely poor. So you could see that these programs, for instance, are being rolled out maybe in 64 districts, like for instance, the community skills development, it's only 11 districts. So as much as they've got a greater impact on poverty, but they're only being given to a very small share of the extremely poor population. Then moving to phase two, this is now where we introduce the cash plus scenarios. So we introduce three scenarios. So in the first scenario, we say we allow for multiple support where we say what to be the impact on coverage, on the coverage and the impact on poverty. If we give all recipients um, multiple support, that means we introduce benefits to all the recipients. Then in scenario two, we align or we extend the, S, the social cash transfer criteria to all other programs. And then in scenario three, we just adjust the number of beneficiaries to the budgeted number. So basically you find that the government will provide to say, and this year we need to give a, a, a certain benefit to this amount of people, but then maybe in practice that doesn't happen. So what we just do in scenario three is we say, okay, based on the budgeted number, let's see if we can roll out all the programs or all the benefits to the budgeted number. So what we found in, in the phase, phase two of our findings is that the coverage of the extremely poor remains largely unaffected by the cash plus reforms. Reason being is, if you remember, I said only 34% of the extremely poor receive the social cash transfer, which is the flow program. So therefore, even if you introduce more benefits, because very few or a small number of the population is receiving the social cash transfer, the impact on poverty really remains unaffected or it doesn't change significantly. Then secondly, uh, poverty also um, remains stable across the cash plus, uh, cash plus reforms. Reason being is that, like I mentioned earlier to say, those benefits with a higher monetary amount have got a greater impact on poverty. But the thing is that they're only being distributed to a small share of the population. So therefore poverty just remains stable across the cash plus reform. So in conclusion, the Zambian government have, are targeting to reduce poverty by 20%, which approximately is eight percentage points but from the results or from the scenarios, we find that in the current configuration of the, the cash plus reform, will not be able to achieve the additional poverty reduction needed to, to reach this target. Therefore, we provide the following recommendations to the government. So firstly, we advise the government to say they should expand the social cash transfer coverage beyond its current coverage because like I mentioned, only 34% of the extremely poor are receiving this flow benefit in which we want to, 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 to incorporate the cash plus. So therefore, if only a small population is receiving, then the impact on poverty, even if you're out the cash plus, won't be so significant. Then secondly, government should commit to providing a high level of support for the social cash transfer. Like I said earlier, uh, those benefits with higher monetary amounts have got a greater impact on poverty. But in its current configuration, the amount that's been provided the social cash transfer is very little. And then also the government should employ the multi-support uh, strategy. So that means government should continue giving multiple benefits to these beneficiaries that qualify to sit on these programs. And fourthly, is just to improve administrative oversight um, this basically has to do with people that are administering the programs because there have been a lot of malpractices, funds being misused as these programs have been rolled out. So it's just government to, to add an extra length in, um, in uh, rolling out of these programs. So as I come to the end of my, my presentation, I just want to give the way forward. So as it is, our project has come to an end. I think uh, Pia is just actually going through the final report. And uh, we are scheduled to disseminate this report to government and all cooperating partners on the 14th of this month. 
And this event will be a physical event. So for the people that will be in Zambia, most likely in Osaka, we'll be able to, to be in the same room. And then secondly, um, those people that, um, that are outside and want to follow the event, there'll be a link that will be shared and people can also log in. So on top of the recommendations that we've provided, a ZIPA, because ZIPA is a, a government wing or government institution, we still want to continue engaging the government to implement the findings and recommendations that have been provided. Further also, we engage various ministries, also go to parliament and relevant stakeholders and see how the findings of the project can be incorporated in the upcoming eighth national development plan, which is currently being crafted. Our seventh national development plan has come to an end. So government is in the process of uh, crafting the eighth national development plan. And we're trying to see ways and means in which we can actually fit into the eighth national development plan. Thank you. And they were uh, for also making more or less than time, which is uh, given uh, the amount of work that I did is a challenge. I'm now waiting for Ronald to pull up his slides. And while Ronald does so, I also wanted to highlight what Mbeva has been showing. It uh, also shows the difficulty, of course, um, in terms of the size of the challenge that the country is facing. And we at the same time also working on another project that looks at the agricultural subsidies with this led by Yuka. There's no time to present that here. Both these projects are also talking to each other so that we make sure that they are aligned. With that, I see that Ronald is ready, set, go. So over to you, Ronald. So thank you so much, Pia. And um, uh, because I have 10 minutes, I'll straight away go to the presentation. Um, so the presentation is about uh, how we are using Yuga mode for evidence policy making in Uganda. And in this presentation, I'm going to discuss, to discuss one case where we have used our model Yuga mode to assess presumptive tax policy in Uganda. So this has been a project, a collaborative project between the tax authority, URA, UNU wider, uh, our colleagues from SASPRI in South Africa, the Ugandan Minister of Finance and Makere University. They are representatives that I'm presenting on behalf of. So it's a bigger team. So a little bit about the project. Um, in July 2020, uh, the government of Uganda reformed the presumptive tax regime uh, for the fourth time since its introduction in 1997. Uh, the change in 2020 was driven by three um justifications one they found that um uh, the old regime which was working up 2019 was regressive and unfair especially to women who are more engaged in small businesses that was mainly fronted by csos the civil society organizations and then two it was perceived to be complex because uh, it had over 80 different tax rates so it was um perceived complex especially in the region by USAID under the Domestic Revenue Mobilization Review, but also there were widespread concerns of high tax rates um, that placed a large, a large financial burden on small companies. So with those discussions, they decided to change it. So the new regime, however, for 2020, posed threats to revenue mobilization as the rates were significantly low, especially for those that keep records, as I will show in the next slides. Now, presumptive tax in Uganda is based on whether you can keep records or not. Now, the rates for those that can keep records are significantly low, which is a threat to revenue mobilization. So as URA, we first of all intended to assess the revenue implications of the new reform, the inequality, the implications of the reform in terms of increasing or reducing inequality, in terms of poverty, and if indeed the new reform is progressive. And therefore, Yuga Mode came in handy. It provided a useful platform to conduct this kind of analysis. So the 2020 presumptive reform looks like this. So the rates were significantly revised backwards. Maybe when you get our, our technical note on this, you'll know the different rates for since 1997. So these are the rates. And now we see that if someone has records, pay significantly lower, as you can see here. These are the different rates. 
And so what we did was to model different scenarios. One, we modeled um, the old regime, which we are calling the 2019 regime, based on the 20, so we, may, we, we modeled the 2020 scenario based on the old regime to set as our baseline. And then we then modeled the 2020 system with the 2020 rules, which are the new rules where records um, are not kept. Like I said, presumptive is based on whether you have records or not. And we then modeled the implications of the 2020 system when taxpayers say we have records. In, in this, we then also had to come up with around four alternative reforms in this presentation I present to. One, a simplified regime with around four bands and where we are removing the requirement of keeping records because we realize that um, from discussions with URA and uh, the tax compliance officer, it's not practical what business records are. And then we also suggest another option, which is a flat rate of just 1%. So the yoga mode, uh, all the scenarios that we have modeled are based on the UNHS 2016-17 data set, but we operate it using the CPI of 2020. Okay, so in terms of the implications, this is what um, we found out, that um, if we apply the old regime on the 2020 system, the potential from, from presumptive is about 320 billion Uganda shillings. However, the new regime, as you can see here, it has significant implications on revenue. For instance, when we model the new regime on the 2020 system, where um, taxpayers declare that they don't have records, we only collect these compared with 320. And if taxpayers say we keep records, we collect actually much less, only 90 billion, compared to the potential of 320. Now, our reform scenarios. Scenario one, which is um, we, we come up with five rates, and scenario two is a scenario where we are assuming that what if we charge a uniform rate of 1% of turnover. So this, the first scenario give us a little more revenue, which is about 252. Of course, still less than the 2019, but at least much more than what the current system is likely to give us. And then scenario two, um, the reform two, which is system three, um, gives us much less, but again, still, much more than we would have expected we, 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 we are likely to get if we implement the current regime so the alternative reforms would have generated more revenue albeit less than that of 2019 but at least better than what the current scenario is likely to be with a new reform now when we look at this for instance we see that direct tax revenue fall by 5.6 percent with records if all presumptive taxpayers kept records, direct taxes would fall by over 8%. You, you can see here, direct taxes. So we see that when you look at um, the implications of poverty, it is just 0 0.2, a reduction of 0 0.2. So there is very little impact on poverty of that old of the new reform, and then also small increments in inequality. And that applies also with, um, our model the scenarios, we see that it will not, they will also, they will also not affect poverty much, and they will also not affect inequality that much, but at least they protect revenue mobilization to some extent. And then when we try to assess the progressivity of the 2020 rules, the new rules, indeed, we found that um, while the, the, the option of whether taxpayers have records or not is progressive, as you can see here, that uh, the red line is the effective tax rate or presumptive, it is increasing with increase in turnover. In this case where people don't have tax uh, records, the, the, the rates are actually regressive. So if, for instance, have a taxpayer who does not keep record with annual turnover 10 million being taxed at 0 0.8, yet one with annual turnover 150 is taxed at 0 0.6. So the rates are still progressive for those that have no records. So our scenarios, these are the scenarios that we are um, modeling. These are very simple. Effective tax rates and tax liabilities increase gradually with higher turnover, and we seek to increase taxpayer morale and attract a larger number of small taxpayers to pay at least some tax. So these are the two scenarios we modeled. And when we put these two scenarios, we see that more revenue compared to the 2020 reforms, 0 0.8, you can see here, compared to 0 0.8 to 1.5, compared to 1.7, 2.56 decrease in actual if, if we use the 2020 reform. 
So the results are very similar using adjusted systems and administrative data, not assuming compliance. And alternative forms also have smaller impact on poverty, as you can see here, 0 0.3 and 0.3% reductions. So they still have small impacts on poverty and inequality. Um, our reforms, all of them are progressive, as you, as you can see here, that uh, the effective tax rate increases with increase in turnover. So, so using the results for policy reform, so what we have so far done, one is we have presented the results to various stakeholders, including URA, the Minister of Finance, Civil Society and Academia. And our total proposals are submitted uh, to the Tax Amendment Committee, which is URA and Minister of Finance, and also, uh, and, and in this Tax Amendment Committee, it will go through URA. So after passing through URA, it will be post sent to Minister of Finance, and once it goes through Minister of Finance, it goes to the last level, which is the Parliament. Now, the beauty we have seen is that, at least for the first time, we have conducted a comprehensive analysis of, of tax policy reforms, especially this presumptive tax, and proposed effective alternative reforms. Previously, the focus was mainly on revenue. Now, with the support of Yugamon, we are empowered to look beyond the revenue implications. At least we assess the implications in terms of inequality, poverty, and progressivity. Okay, so that is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, I realize there's an issue with my hand. It's going to work now. If it doesn't, um, we'll take over. Um, so I would, at this point, um, if the sound is fine, if anyone can give me can give me a thumb up, if you can hear me fine. Um, uh, I think your sound is uh, a bit breaking still, but maybe you can try to continue. And if not, uh, then uh, I can take over, for example. But uh, maybe you can you can try okay, to go ahead. Thank you, Anna. Then what I would like to try now is it seems um, that the colleague from Mozambique is really having very hard technical problems He's out of Maputo and doesn't have doesn't get internet. That therefore I was a bit of surprise, but uh, if possible, Gemma, could you kindly just tell a little bit about that project verbally, uh, where it came from, what was simulated? And where it's at the curious stage to learn about the project before we open the floor for questions and answers. Gemma, if you wouldn't mind, I can also do it, but you've been more involved in that process. So I think you are better than me. For speaking, you would need to click the button pop on the right to ask to share and then your video. Okay. Gemma is joining. Hello. Good morning, everybody. And um, you have um, caught me completely by surprise, so I'm going to show you a picture of my wall rather than myself, but I will share with you my voice. Um, also, um, I am not aware of the title of the presentation by the Mozambique colleague, so which particular activity would you like me to discuss here? I think benefits uh, and and how 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 it's situated and I understand I think that would be interesting um oh, so yeah. Sorry, could, how, please, could you put it in the chat because I'm I'm not hearing your answer <laughs> Gemma we sent you a private message but it's a shame the private messages are not very oh, visible project. Okay, thank you so much. That's wonderful. Okay, well, um, good morning, everybody. And um, what I will attempt to do completely um, off the cuff is tell you about the work that we have undertaken with the Ministry of Finance um, in Mozambique, working also with colleagues from INES and UNICEF Mozambique to um, explore the possibility of rolling out a universal child benefit across Mozambique. This stems from uh, um, 
so-called retreat that took place um, within um, Mozambique a few weeks ago that was also um, supported by the ILO, where different members of um, government came together and worked with our colleagues at, at the country team um, to explore particular um, policy um, um, questions. And one of them was the question of the rollout of the child, um, child benefit, which is currently being piloted in a small number of districts in, in Mozambique by UNICEF at the moment. The um, exact design of the study was um, firmed up during that retreat. And then the team who worked on, on this particular policy brief went away and modeled a number of different scenarios, um, exploring um, different options and then looking at the distributional impact of those benefits. And um, what was very interesting for me was that there was a big discussion about whether to explore, um, whether to target the benefits or to consider universal provision. And the group felt very strongly that given the high levels of um, child poverty across the country, um, that only universal options should be explored. And so um, the, um, the study itself I explored a number of different levels of benefit payments um, that, um, and, and, and then the, the impact of that on poverty. And as one would expect, um, the, the, the larger the benefits, the, um, the, the more effective it was in reducing poverty in households containing children. But what I found um, most uh, rewarding about the activity was that um, there were people involved from the Ministry of Social Affairs, that's in us, and the Ministry of Finance and, um, and UNICEF all working together with the model and getting to know the ins and outs of how the model operates and how changes that are made to a particular policy might have a ripple effect on other parts of the model. And so that hands-on experience for the group of having a few days of working together in the retreat and then pursuing it um, with the um, leadership and coordination of Rodrigo from the um, um, from UNU wider um, was a true team effort and the plan is that this will now be released during the social protection week and there will be policy briefs produced in collaboration with the ILO. And then UNICEF will use it in its engagements with government um, to um, promote discussion and, and consideration of options for providing for deprived children and, and also exploring possible sources of finances and fiscal space for, for such um, a, a, a an exciting initiative. So I hope that that um, impromptu summary gives a bit of an overview, but I'd happily answer questions. Thank you, Tema. Maybe I will talk on behalf of uh, Pia now. And uh, Pia just sent a message to Jukka, if Jukka would be able to chair uh, the rest of the discussion, if that's possible. Jukka Pirtila, and uh, uh, you can ask uh, so that I can take you on stage. You have the blue button there, and uh, so that for the Q&A. And I see there are for now no questions at Q&A, so I encourage everyone to uh, write their questions there in case you have. Okay, Jukka is joining now. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> All right. So, um, so we won't be able to um, get the presentation from Mozambique, right? Mm. That's right. Okay. So, um, in um, are there are there comments or, or feedback for the um, um, for the two present presentations on the, on on the um, cash plus in Zambia? 
or the um, presumptive in, in Uganda. So feel free to uh, to write uh, to the uh, to the uh, Q and A box or to the chat. Mm. Yeah, and Gemma, you... uh, Gemma gave a small uh, small introduction of the Mozambique one also, so I'm sure Gemma can. That's true. That. Yes, of course. Yes, I mean, yeah. questions are welcome also for the for the Mozambique regarding the Mozambique study. Uh, so while you think about your your question, so let me start off with uh, asking the Cash Plus team about the um, the role of financing all this. So I mean, can you give us uh, some pointers about the discussions in the country about the I mean, I mean, what you had uh, about the financing side, namely, I mean, covering the additional costs via taxes, uh, and why why those were not considered when when you when you considered the expansion of the uh, um, of the programs maybe maybe bebe i maybe you can chip in thanks thanks yuka um we did actually do a bit of simulations on the impact of, of, of the of, on the financing side, what would be the impact on revenue. But of course, looking at the tight fiscal space, it's quite it's quite difficult to actually ask, for instance, government to pull up money from the treasury. But then most of these programs are actually donor funded. So uh our lobbying side is that government can lobby with the donor so that they can um increase um the the monetary amounts or the support okay i see i see yeah. thanks for that mm -hmm. so i see um uh, guabena in the and the chat had a very similar uh question regarding the possibilities of scaling up because of the of the resource constraints so i i, I think that was sort of um, more or less covered here and um, and also previously pia um, had a question on on, on all to, for all the presenters, uh, asking you to um, elaborate on what were the main challenges in the uh, in the work that you that that you did using the models. Okay, I can go first on that one as well. Please do. Yeah. So for us, the Cash Plus team, I think our biggest challenge was uh, the data constraint because of modeling of uh, different programs that are sitting in um, in different uh, ministries, it was quite hard to get all program managers together and give us the data that we required at any given point in time. So this significantly dropped the project because this project I think was supposed to be done, I think in the first quarter of this year, but it's been dragging because even on a request for data, you find some program managers are not able to avail us with the correct data. So we find that we kept on moving the project forward. So our biggest challenge was the data constraint. Okay, maybe I can also say something. Um, of course. Honestly, I, I, I don't see any, I don't think of any challenges that we really faced in this particular one. I think it was easy, maybe issues to deal with the uh, team, team cohesion, availability of teams, because now this team was a little bit diverse. So you had to make sure that uh, people from different teams are available and at times people were so engaged in other activities. But uh, generally in terms of the modeling and the writing, I think we did not find really any significant challenges. Other challenges I can think of uh, beyond our control those are institutional bureaucracies, especially when it comes to organizing some of these events. WIDA has its institutional policies, and even these institutions have their institutional policies. So you 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 get into those problems, but uh, really, there, there's really nothing much that we faced. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Gemma, would you like to um, go next? Um, <clears throat> It was a pleasure working on this policy brief, not just because of the importance of trying to reduce and even eliminate child poverty, um, um, 
but also because modeling child benefits is a relatively straightforward thing to do on a model, um, on, on a South Nord model. And so um, technically it wasn't burdensome, but it has potential high um, policy impact. My greatest um, frustration is that I don't speak Portuguese um, and of course, the, um, um, the, that is the main language of, of government in Mozambique and is the language of the policy brief. Um, but I think that is also an important feature um, of modelling to um, ensure that it can be expressed in different languages and that the same meanings are retained and commonly understood. I think that's potentially something that we could explore more in South Nord. We don't have um, a, any um, models that, that use French. Um, and so what we have with the Mozambique model is that it is in fact in English, well, it's in Euromod Ease, the, the software language, but the, um, um, it's essentially in English. But in the comments column, it is written, it's been translated by Vanda um, into Portuguese to aid people's understanding. But I think it's very exciting that the policy brief this time is being written in the first instance in the language um, of, of, of government and communications. And happily for me, I've discovered that words can instantly translate things pretty effectively from Portuguese into English with a click of a button. So it was much more straightforward than I feared. Thank you, everybody. So um, uh, maybe just one final comment before our time is, or, or, or one final question rather, before our time is up. Um, how do, how would you describe the um, response among policymakers? Uh, how, um, the interest on this, and 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 is there a follow-up work um, ongoing or upcoming um, regarding similar simulations or or, or something else? Maybe. Yeah. Thanks, Yuka. Um, in terms of our project, uh, I think there's been um, uh, support from the ministry that's actually trying to administer this, that's the Ministry of Community Development. They've been very supportive. We've had Mr. Mkupa, who's more like in charge of this project, who's actually even been the one that was pushing these program managers in terms that we needed the data. So I think there's a lot of buy-in from the ministry, and they're actually looking forward to give them the final product. And then I think after that, there should be room for expansion or, yeah, there should be room for more work to be done on this. Yeah. And I think from my side, uh, what I can say is, um, first of all, the, the, the right from the start of the project, we engaged um, our stakeholders right from Minister of Finance and then URA. So, but also to um, this this is part of our work, and it is they keep asking us, "Do have we analyzed these policies?" And like I say, this has been one of the most comprehensive analysis on the tax policy we have ever done. So definitely, they they like it. It it, it went beyond just looking at revenue. Yeah, I and mean, and for the part of the Mozambique study. I think it's um, important to say that this was undertaken at the at the express request of INES and, and UNICEF. They could see the potential of using MOSMOD to explore these issues. They had a number of different evaluations of the um, pilot that is being implemented at the moment, but wanted to have some information on the, on the costs using the model and so it was in response to their requests that this activity was undertaken and it will be used widely um, by the Ministry of Finance and, and UNICEF once um, the, um, it's, it's all been um, finalised, it will be in just the next week or so. 
Excellent, excellent. I'm pleased to hear. So uh, uh, now our, our time is up. Uh, thank you for excellent presentations. Um, thank you for the work you have done uh, with, respect, with, with, with the models. And thank you, Gemma, for for, for chipping in at the, <laughs> without any warning. Uh, the activities. <laughs> See you in the other sessions. Bye bye. Yes, good stuff. Bye bye. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.